The kids center was were taken over by 21 kids for PD day camp. So I just wanted to reach out to say thanks to my wife Joan and uh, Cassidy, my daughter, and the youth group that did a fabulous job on Friday, and and it was a whole day. So a uh, whole day of little 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 tiny little tiny people running around. So thank you very much. So I just want to say that. Good morning. My name is Anne Marie Collins. I'm on the search committee, and we just want to remind everyone that uh, next week, Sunday, November 3rd, we have called a congregational meeting uh, for the purpose of receiving the report of the committee. Thank you. Yes, as Jerry said, I am electric or static. I'm not sure. Um, John Van Berlo, and um, first of all, hearing devices. We have new hearing devices. If you're having trouble hearing Jerry, um, I know that's hard to believe, but if you have trouble hearing Jerry, uh, we have devices now on the desk at the in the lobby, and you can get one of those, they fit over your ear, and you can adjust the volume, so it's like having somebody just yelling right in your ear, if you want. So, uh, they are available. If uh, you would like to, I can meet you in the lobby, and uh, I can fit one on your ear, if you like. Uh, number two, um, I don't know if you've read it in the Friday file, but um, the Mennonite community has a number of... Uh, chicken farms and they would like to get our um, egg cartons. So if you have egg cartons, rather than recycling them, you, they can be reused and uh, we'll get them out there to the um, Mennonite store in Tiverton so they can be distributed from there. And the third thing is, I don't know if you heard about the uh, Salvation Army in Wyerton. It was broken into last week. And next week, Sunday, we'd like to support them with our own food drive. So please, if you have canned goods or boxed goods like non-perishables, please bring those here next Sunday. And Maria, who's up there at the camera, will be sure to get them over to the Salvation Army. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, my name is Zoe Wolf, and I am one of the youth group leaders. On Halloween night, the youth group will be in this area trick or canning. We would appreciate any canned goods you could provide us if we are in this area. This year we will be donating the food donations to the food basket. Thank you and happy Halloween. Thank you. Zoe is one of our youth leaders and um, I was just sharing with a couple of people that uh, our first week we had six youth. The second week we had nine, and this past Friday night we had 12, so we're growing. And thank you very much, Zoe, for being one of the leaders in our youth group. Um, just want to mention, um, I know that I put something in the Friday file, but I am heading away for a month's holiday, and I'm hoping that some people will step in and give uh, Grace Rainey and Kathy um, a hand with the fellowship time, preparing the goodies and the, and the refreshments. So um, please um, come forward and help either... Uh, to prepare ahead of time or maybe to clean up after. Thank you. Speaking of Grace Rainey, Grace made, drew, created that angel picture that is sitting at the front. We're having, she is donating it for a special event next Saturday, which is sold out. But we have an opportunity for you if you'd like to have it in your home, we decided we'd let this church have first dibs on the silent auction. So you can see Grace and I in the activity center after church. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? At this point, you wouldn't dare, right? 
My name is Jerry Hofstetter. I'm privileged to be in transitional ministry here at Port Elgin United Church. And I want to acknowledge Fort Jackson at the piano. Uh, this is a Sunday that Brenda is uh, not here with us, and Bert has volunteered his time, as a number of people within the congregation do from time to time on the piano. So thanks, Bert, for, for doing what you're doing. And uh, Bert doesn't have a piano at his home. So he has to find other ways to, to practice and rehearse. So I'm just throwing it out there. If anybody has a spare piano, I should have asked Bert first. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the very center of their being, their living, their spirituality. The United Church of Canada acknowledges that we meet regularly on territories, traditional territories of indigenous people. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land and their spirituality with respect and thanks. Jack, you're going to help me with the candle this morning? This is the time. I'm going to get this ready for us while you're on your way. You can come right up here. Your impishness I always find a little scary. Okay, you want to grab a hold here? Okay. Actually, tell you what. You're short enough, we're going to try something else. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm entitled to one change of mind. Okay. You're going to have to reach up above your head. Okay, you take a hold of the bottom. There you go. Now, reach up as much as you can. There you go. And we're going to make this work. Ta-da. Now, you can shut it off by pulling that down. Okay, just pull that down. And you see the fire goes out. Awesome. Thank you. The light of Christ is to be for us a reminder not only of who we are, but whose we are, and our responsibility as followers of the Christ, the light of the world. We call this house of prayer home. To some of life's greatest transitions, times of joy, times of struggle, where we have felt God's presence. We gather now in this mystery we call worship. In this place we name a house of prayer, daring to believe that we can somehow connect with the one who made us. Let us worship God. Let's sing together, Holy Spirit, hear us. I invite us to stand in body or in spirit. Come with shouts of joy, 
and hearts filled with gratitude. We come weighted with burdens and hardened with hardships. May you receive our praise and relieve us of our burdens. Salt us with your grace and flavor us with your mercy. Bind our hearts together that we may be at peace with one another and in unity worship you. Amen. I invite our Discovery Cove folk to join me at the front of the church, please. Everyone finds a spot. Patrick and Theodore, did I see you bringing in some Timbits this morning? Are they for all of us? For your class anyway, I expect. Are they? Or are they for the afterwards? I don't know. I'm asking because I don't know. For afterwards? Well, that's super. I'll try to make sure I get one. <laughs> They are usually among the things that go first, aren't they? You like Timbits? Who of us likes Timbits? And all the hands go up. Who of us this morning thinks we're all alike? We all do things exactly the same way. Does any of us think that way? We're all different. We're all different. Some of us can do some things better than others. Some of us probably think we do some things less well than others. Who here among us is the oldest child, even if you're an only child, in your family? Okay? Share with me, if you can, anything that's special about being the oldest or the only. Yes. You get new clothes. <laughs> Yes, here and then that. Yes? You can't think right now. Yes? You get the new bikes, no hand me downs. Right. Did you have a suggestion? Anything you can think of? Yes, you have a suggestion. You're not the oldest. We'll get to you. Any other oldest here? Okay. Okay, now you have an idea? Yeah, sometimes you do things better and more important stuff than your younger siblings. Exactly. I'm, I'm the eldest of uh, six kids and I got to do most things first. To the point that none of my siblings ever did it as well as I did. <laughs> I learned from them. I was in my, that was part of my thinking at that time and I'm going to speak for that in a minute. You had an idea before you get second chance, okay? Go ahead. Now this is from a younger perspective, right? Yes. Go ahead. He gets the bigger rooms. Oh, well. In my experience, that's true too. Uh, there were three of us boys in one room and three girls in another. And uh, when mom and dad, whose bedroom used to be upstairs, was moved downstairs, then that room became available and I, as the eldest, moved into it. Yes, I know. Shame, shame, shame. One more. You're the tallest. There are any number of things we can talk about. Some of us might think we listen better. Some of us might think we learn more easily. Some of us, some of us might think we have an advantage and use that advantage because we're bigger, whether we're taller or older or more sturdy. Some of us here can probably read better than some others. Some may not be at the level of reading yet. Some of us can write or print. Some maybe not. When you get older, you'll probably learn some keyboarding skills. You might learn how to touch type, like I did. I was one of the very few boys in my typing class. And my teacher, the second day of the class, told me I would never be able to type very well. Because he looked at my hands and he said, you've come off the farm, haven't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, farm boys don't type. <laughs> and I said, why? 
Because he said, most things we do in your farm, when you're carrying things, you're using all of your fingers together. And they're not taught to operate. Your fingers need to be taught how to work. They're not taught to operate independently. Which makes perfect sense. Which you need to do when you're typing. I said, but sir, I play the piano. Oh, then you'll be fine. <laughs> Can we think of any other things that we might think we do better than others? Play hockey. Are you a star? No? Not yet? Anything else? Yes? You learned how to skate first or he did? He did. Do you skate now? Yes? Do you enjoy skating? Are you? I'm sorry? You've been on TV for it. Well, I didn't know that. Shame on me. So you're the star. He may have learned how to skate first, but you're the star. One more, over here. Some of us are good runners. Some of us may not be the fastest, but we can last the longest. If you're in, in long distance running. There are all kinds of ways. The important thing for us is when we celebrate the things we can do well, to not think that we're better than anyone else. We may be able to do some things in a different way that some might perceive to be better. But we're all special, we're all needed, we're all part of families, we all have a part to play. We're going to uh, repeat the Lord's Prayer together. And then we're going to sing a song that involves you helping me with one action. Okay? So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, our in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Remaining seated, we're going to sing a song that the title is, And On This Path. And some of us maybe don't read yet, so the words just go like this. And on this path, what I want us to know is to learn the words, The gates of holiness are open wide. Okay, can you repeat after me? The gates of holiness. Can we say that? The gates of holiness are open wide. Are open wide. All together, the gates of holiness are open wide. And the action is, what do you think might be an appropriate action for the gates of holiness are open wide? Yes. Just like that, Tesla. Right. Just like that. So when we sing, the gates of holiness are open wide, that's what we're going to do. So don't sit so closely to someone that you end up whacking them. All right? So if you don't sing any words but that, if you don't sing, and on this path, you're going to be ready for, the gates of holiness are open wide, and on this path. The gates of holiness are open wide, and on this path. I'm not in the right key, but the gates of holiness are open wide, open wide. Open wide, open wide, the gates are open wide. Now you're scared. Just follow me. Bert will give us an intro and we'll sing. We can do this. A little higher than I was. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide, and on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide, open wide, open wide, open wide, the gates are open wide. So enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide, so enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide. Oh, it's a romance, boy. Oh, it's a romance, boy.
How are the gates positioned? Come on, help me here, I'm dying. <laughs> the gates are open wide. Exactly. Thanks for all your help. Have a good morning at Discovery Cove. Don't move so quickly that you stumble, okay? Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We thank God for these words.
I begin this morning by asking a question. I have a question for us. If we were to, tomorrow, casually stroll to wherever we collect our mail, and find the following items there, which would we open first? Are we clear on the picture? All right. An invoice from the bay, an ad for life insurance, a catalog from Victoria's Secret. I expected that, actually. <laughs> or a brown envelope from the Canada Revenue Agency. Which would we open first? It's not a rhetorical question. The brown envelope. That would have been my wild guess. We would probably open that envelope first. Because the moment we saw it, our anxiety level went up. Our hands might be a little shaky. Our mind might be racing. We may practically destroy that envelope in order to get to the contents. And our tension and anxiety would probably increase if anywhere in the first couple sentences we saw the word audit. Very few of us greet a CRA audit with enthusiasm. We wonder if we did anything wrong. We wonder if our records will adequately support our tax return. We wonder just how much money we're going to get back as a result of the audit. No, wait. Make that how much more we're going to need to pay as a result of the audit. Let's just say that a tax audit is not one of the blessings that in our Thanksgiving celebrations we highlight. Now, I want us to imagine the person behind the desk at the CRA, the one who will be responsible for our audit. Imagine that he or she is not only intimidating and distrustful, but also dishonest. Imagine that he will receive a percentage of the corrected amount resulting from the audit, and that she will say or do almost anything to prove her point. Now, please understand, I'm in no way implying that any of our CRA people operate this way at all. I know some of them personally. I've also been audited a number of times. Because in our household, our health costs, well, this fellow alone had three major surgeries in ten months and preceded a few years back by two months of radiation therapy so till you travel to London all those times and back and forth, we were, when filing online, we were above the norm. And those are the ones that get flagged. Even when you're doing the filing, it says, you better double check this because it looks abnormal. Well, it is abnormal. It was abnormal. We're into our third audit. Each time, nothing changed, everything's fine, but they're doing their job and I realize they're doing their job. I grudgingly realize they're doing their job. And so right now, all of the stuff has been sent, duly noted, it's all there, I know it's been received, we're still waiting. The scenario that I painted for us, though, is the way that the tax collectors operated in the time of Jesus. Among the most despised, feared, corrupt people in the society of Jesus' day. They were out to get not just a few select people here and there, but everybody. 
and they frequently operated beyond the law with no fear of punishment, reprisal. They changed the rules whenever they wanted to, collecting taxes from people in heartless and dishonest ways. So we read. Two men went up to the temple to pray, Jesus said. <coughs> One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed just loudly enough that he could barely be heard across the street. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give back to you a tenth of all, receive, of all I receive. But, Jesus said, the tax collector stood a little ways off. He wouldn't even lift his eyes. He beat his chest and whispered, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You might not believe this, said Jesus indicating the tax collector. But this man, rather than the other, went away justified before God. Whoa. Wait a minute. Did I hear that correctly? Did he just really say that? What in the world's going on here? What in the world is going on here? It's a question we could ask about lots of Luke's stories. Words involving words and actions of Jesus. What's going on when God sends God's only son to be born of a peasant girl in a Bethlehem stable? What's going on when Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman at the well? Knowing that Jews didn't talk to Samaritans and men didn't talk to women. Two strikes. What's going on when Jesus allows a woman of the streets to wash his feet with her hair, wash his feet rather, with her tears and dry with her hair? What's going on when Jesus invites Zacchaeus, another tax collector, down out of the tree and goes to his home for dinner? More about that next week. What's going on when God allows his son to be nailed to a cross to die the death of of a criminal. What's going on? And we continue to ask that question. I ask that question. People ask that question of me on almost a daily basis. If we were to visit Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, we'd see a lot of really good work going on. But we'd also see children with a variety of illnesses at different stages with tests to determine the severity of their illness, the stage of their recovery, the likelihood of relapse, the course of treatment necessary for each child. Some would be very sick. Some would die. Some would be crying. Others would be bravely holding back their tears. Not many would be laughing and playing and running as healthy children are expected to do. What's going on there? What's going on is life. What's going on is humanity, mortality, the limits and frailties, even the brokenness of human existence. It's the reality that every one of us falls short of what we would deem to be a perfect way of living. Every one of us falls short of living a loving, faithful life. 
Every one of us struggles with the hollowness and emptiness that from time to time creeps in as we try to cope with the secret or public sorrows of our lives. What's going on? As we hear this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we hear again the gospel theme of reversal, the flip. We've talked about the reversal, the flip, the backwards, forwards, any number of times. Upside down. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. The unexpected is to be what we should expect from Jesus. The one we expect to be judged faithful is not. The one we expect, or even secretly wish, to be condemned is redeemed. Two men went to the same temple to pray, or two men went to the same temple for the same reason, to pray. And yet they experienced such different results. Because their approach to prayer was so different. The Pharisee used prayer as a means to get public attention, public recognition, not to seek fellowship or connection with God. In fact, the Pharisee, if we were to expand a little bit in my imaging, stops just short of congratulating God on what a great job God did in creating him. Every time I read this parable, that old song comes to mind. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I thought I might sing a bit of it, but I was afraid I wouldn't do it right. So easy for our best intention, prayers of thanksgiving, to slip into self-congratulation, even as our best acts of charity can become subtle ways of making ourselves look good. God, on behalf of the rest of the world, I want to thank you for putting me here. Like the Pharisee, we sometimes don't seek God's mercy in that kind of prayer. The hard truth of prayer, in my experience in life, is that frequently we get exactly for what we ask. We get exactly for what we ask. Like the Pharisee, we don't always ask for mercy, so we don't get it. Now please understand, this tax collector is not a good person. He's a man who has been dishonest, probably sometimes cruel. His humility is not a virtue we ought to copy, necessarily. But his realistic assessment of his own mistakes, his acknowledgement of his shortcomings, his need for forgiveness is something to which we ought to pay some attention. There is no hero in this story. There's no white hats and black hats. No hero here. Both of the characters have shortcomings. One acknowledges it, the other doesn't. Dare I say, just like me. Just like us. This is a story about prayer and worship. Like a typical Sunday morning. Worship service in any church, anywhere. In any service of worship, we can mainly find two kinds of folks. Pharisees and tax collectors. Very few of us are one or the other all the time, but most of us are some of the other, some of the time. There are times when we come to worship as good, righteous Pharisees who ask for nothing and get exactly that. We're so pleased with ourselves, so competent, so well-liked in the community, and we go home to Sunday dinner with a gnawing emptiness which we sometimes blame on the preacher, and sometimes rightfully so, but most often because we were so full when we arrived at worship that nothing else would fit. There was no room for anything else. 
And then there are other times, hopefully more often than not, when we enter this house of, wor house of worship as tax collectors. Lost, empty, painfully aware of our shortcomings, our need of God's mercy. And hopefully, prayerfully, we go home with more than that for which we ask. The gift is God's to meet out, out of God's incomprehensible mercy. God's love extends to people of all shapes, sizes, colors, gender. Whether we agree with the choices they've made or not. Whether they have memorized the great prayers and the great creeds of the church or not and can quote them on demand. Or whether the best any of us can muster is God have mercy on me. It's only through God's mercy, through God's gift of love, that we ever return home from a worship experience in any different way than that from which we came. So I say thanks be to God for all of us. The good news is that God is gracious slow to anger, quick to forgive, and abounding in steadfast love. The gates of holiness are that's barely a squeak. The gates of holiness are open wide. May it be so. Let's sing together. Come to my heart. the challenge of God to share who we are and what we are in the work of God's kingdom. When we offer of who we are and what we have, when we make our offerings, we worship God. When our offerings are received and dedicated and blessed, 
we worship God. Let's continue in our worship of God. as we share of who we are and what we have. We make our offerings in response to your acknowledged love for us. We make our offerings in response to your call to share in the work of your kingdom. As such, we pray that you will bless our giving and our living in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite us to assume an attitude of prayer. Let's pray. Holy One, we can talk long and loud about the need for peace. Or we can work behind the scenes to bring people together. Humility doesn't always come easily or naturally to us, Holy One. So we need your help. You call us to recognize proud behavior and to humble ourselves. We can talk about opportunity for those without jobs or we can give practical advice. Behind the scenes and openly. We can speak of all the health services we've received. Or we can enable persons without confidence or ability to access services to which they're entitled. We can brag about our difficulties and recoveries. Or we can quietly give thanks for restored health. We can tell the bereaved to get over their loss. Or we can stay with them for as long as grieving takes. We can speak openly of the dangers of leadership burnout. Or we can quietly or openly offer help with leadership tasks. Creator God, humility doesn't always come easily or naturally to us. So we need your help. Save us from the pride that insists on its own way. Give us the humility that sees the needs of the other person. Save us from the pride that does not admit defeat. Give us the humility that lets us start again. Save us from the pride that refuses to share with others. Give us the humility that works in community. Love us and keep us humble, Holy One. 
Keep us working to be humble. Amen. As we acknowledge God's gifts and God's greatness, let's sing together how great thou art.